Hey, good evening, and welcome to our second week of reincarnation and karma. Um, I am going to take a little break after tonight, um, just because I've got lots of other things I need to work on right now that have come up. So, um, so we'll finish up tonight, and um, then I'll keep you posted about the seven steps for releasing the year. I'm going to be doing that process myself anyway, so you know, I'm hoping to be able to share that with you, but I'll keep you posted with that. I'll, I'll send something out regardless, um, week to week that will, that will help us with that process of releasing 2020 and, um, you know, being open to our new awesome possibilities for the year 2021. So, um, be watching for that. I'm going to share my screen here so we can get started. All right, here we go. Uh -huh. Slideshow, come on. Okay. Okay, so reincarnation and karma, what we need to know. Last week, we had a little nice overview of, of karma and the process of reincarnation and karma. Um, you know, how all that plays out. We met Jim and Sally and the other guy who remains unnamed to this day. And we watched Sally's iceberg grow throughout her incarnations, um, adding people, places, situations in her life, experiences, skills, um, difficulties. And we learned about her latent karma that is not part of who she is today. Um, and as we see this, it's important to know that this is how our icebergs were created too. So Sally is you, Sally is me, Sally is each person um, walking around on this planet. We all have this going on. Um, so we're going to continue from here for today. Um, and I wanted to share this picture, um, Jane Elizabeth, calls this the ball of karma. And so this is Sally's great big ball of karma and yours and mine and his and hers and, and everybody's. And if we go back, you remember these lines that connect her first lifetime to her second, to her third, and, and all the way through today, that is the pattern. Those are karmic patterns, right? So there's skills involved with our karmic patterns and there's the difficulties involved with our karmic patterns. And so for, um, for the yellow lifetime, if, if I had wanted to kind of mess up my picture with all the lines, you know, that yellow would be going through each lifetime and the gray and the blue and the purple and the green and the darker gray and the brown and all of those would be going through to create um, that wonderful great big ball of karma that is hanging out in our iceberg. And this is what we unravel. And so we, when we're working on um, ourselves, we're understanding, you know, whether we know what our past lives are or not, we're working on um, re releasing those karmic patterns that we have. And they're very apparent in this lifetime. So we don't have to know our past lifetimes to be able to see what um, issues we have that travel with us. Um, you know, the, the more kind of a rule of thumb is if you, if you say, oh my gosh, I thought I've worked on this a hundred times and here it is again in my face, I guarantee you that's the sign that it is a, a soul issue. And, um, you know, and it's important. That means it's more important to work on it that 101, <laughs> 101st time, <laughs> one, 101, 101st time or 150th time or however many times it takes to loosen that rubber band from that, that, karmic ball um, and take that off so that it's not interfering with how we're seeing the world again today. So there are three kinds of karma, just so you understand more about that iceberg, the karma which has already been created in our past lives and stored up. Um, and um, those, those are the gray areas and we'll get to the iceberg picture again in a minute. So karma that, that's been created in other life lifetime stored up, but we're not currently using, which were the little gray blobs in my iceberg picture for Sally. Um, there's the karma that has cre been created in 
previous lifetimes, which is bearing fruit at the present moment. So the karma we're working out in this lifetime, the positive and the difficult, both. Um, so the act of karma, and then the karma, which we're now in the process of creating by our thoughts and actions, such a lovely thought that we're always creating karma um, that continues to reinforce some of our issues, reinforce our skills and potential and, and all of that. So it's all um, being stored all the time. So our life plan coming into the, this world um, in this incarnation, uh, I'm just gonna touch on this briefly. Um, our life plan is created from pieces of karma based on the lessons we wanted to learn in this lifetime and um, what situations and who is available to us for our lifetime. So the parents we have, um, we have our particular parents because other souls that could have potentially been our parents weren't available at the same time. So, you know, all of this gets set up um, between lives before we come into this planet and knowing the lessons that we're learning and, and why we have to learn them. And, and it's at some level, our, our soul understands that even though um, we come into this world and we're not conscious of it or we get distracted by, you know, flashy things or other desires that are also in there, but, you know, maybe weren't as strong, but we reinforce them so they get stronger and then we lose track of what we're supposed to be doing sometimes or sometimes we just really are super focused on what it is that we came in to do. And so we're, you know, we stick to our plan. I don't know, we have free will, everybody's different. Um, so in one lifetime, we have many karmic segments that we're dealing with. So, you know, going back to, let me see, I can't remember if it's on the next one. Yeah, so if we go back to Sally's iceberg, which is our iceberg, yours and mine, um, all these different colors in her conscious part that has made up who Sally is um, could be thought of as, as, as different segments. Like, okay, she maybe in her, her brown lifetime, um, that was her spiritual lifetime, maybe she was a priest. And so she, her devotion and her commitment to her spiritual life is part of her lifetime. And maybe it's really important to her when she's younger, or maybe it's really important to her when she's going into adulthood, or maybe it's not so important to her until she's middle-aged or at the end of her life or whatever. Or maybe there's a couple of different sections where she's playing out that priest karma. Maybe she's very devout growing up in her family and then kind of lets it go for a while. But then this there's a stirring in her sometime in her 50s, let's say. And so she revisits that devotional piece that helps propel her in this lifetime. Doesn't mean that she'll be Catholic, probably means that she won't be actually, since she's been there, done that, checked it off her list, but who knows, it doesn't matter, right? It's, it's more about her, you know, how that's getting stirred in her life. And it may look different depending on different times of her life. So, um, so this veil between the conscious and the subconscious mind um, is thick, sometimes and it's thin sometimes right but there's always information leaking out from our subconscious mind that if we're paying attention to it can help us understand some of our own past lives um, some of these leakage leakages come out through dreams maybe you've had a dream that you're in some other time period and you had the attire and the the scenery of some other time period and pay attention to that because it could be not just that you watched a movie from that time period recently. It could be that, you know, this is your subconscious leaking that information to you and, you know, maybe just jot those things down and see what plays out because the more you pay attention to it, the more aware of the information you are as it comes up. Meditation is a way where leakages of information come up from our subconscious reflection and we're going to do a little bit of this today um, with those handouts that I that I shared um, eventually and visions you can have a vision of something intuition you know some people do past life regressions and get information but I would encourage you if you do past life regressions you know that that information um, is valuable beyond that 
one time, you know, or if you have somebody read reading your Akashic record, you know, which is reading your subconscious, your iceberg, um, and giving you information about that, that there's there's a little bit of information has a lot of potential understandings of you. So it's not just a one-time thing. Oh, I now I know why, you know, I don't like airplanes or something. Okay, well, that's good to know. But if you, if you hang out with that information, it's not just about airplanes. It's not just about that. There's, there's a lot more that has gone into that. Um, and if you write that down, then information comes up a little bit at a time. So maybe, you know, five years from now, there's more information around that. So paying attention to these leakages in your, from your subconscious um, is really can be very interesting in finding out what else is laying around in there. So I thought this was an interesting picture. Wherever we go, there we are. And that for me was meaning, um, you know, sometimes we have to work on things over and over again because we've had a lot of lifetimes that have reinforced some of these soul issues. So I love this picture because here's this, this woman and she's falling in love with a man and oh my gosh, how wonderful. And the next lifetime she's a warrior and, and cutting people's heads off. And then she's, I don't know what she's doing and, or he's doing. She becomes a he and he's doing something in that lifetime, a scribe per se maybe. And then um, then some kind of leader. And then here's her devotional life in the corner here. And then finally, okay, I'm done with all this. I'm done reincarnating. I'm done with coming back over and over again, trying to entertain myself enough or trying to get things right or trying to be a good person. And I don't know how to do it because there's other things going on. And, you know, and I need to learn about those other things going on so that I can get myself off of this cycle this karmic cycle. All right. So why bother with previous lives? And this is directly from some handouts um, that Jane Elizabeth gave during her reincarnation classes in the past. Um, I believe they're available on the Center for Enlightenment website as well. Um, so why bother with pre previous, previous lives? We can truly know our whole self when we understand those pieces and the soul issues, we can really understand our whole self because as we work through those soul issues, then we have more room for our infinite consciousness to be more aware, to be more part of our conscious mind rather than, you know, us not being very conscious of it because we've got the big iceberg in the way of our conscious mind and our wholeness, our oneness. Um, and another benefit is to live our oneness with others and cosmic consciousness to help us understand our everyday, average day-to-day -day problems. Um, again, if we react to something over and over again, then it's a, it's, it's a sure sign that that's been there for a long time and probably another lifetime and, um, you know, and, and it deserves our time and effort to understand it and to to heal it and then we are healing ourselves at a soul level you know understanding our our skills and our hobbies I've mentioned before that my son is a musician and um, sat down at the piano when he was four and just plucked at the keys a little bit differently than his older sibling did when when they were younger and um, you know and it just we understand that, you know, he's been at that piano many times before. Um, so this time it was easier for him to pick up than it was for me, let's say, who quit after two years of piano lessons because I didn't really like practicing very much. It didn't call to me like it did to my son. So just understanding those things is interesting, you know, and it's always fabulous to see like the, the four-year-old on YouTube belting out some opera song or whatever. And, you know, that, I mean, that is like, you know, reincarnation evidence in action, right? Because what four-year-old can belt out an opera song? But, you know, it just shows that, hey, that voice has been developed and we come into this world with a DNA and the genes and the, the ancestry or whatever to support whatever it is we're here to work on. And one of the things that, that has been mm, just my preference over the years is, is I 
I am so much more interested in my soul history than I am my family history because, and not that that's not interesting and I like hearing stories about that, but, but I'm way more affected by my past lives than I am about my, uh, by my ancestors. And even though generational trauma is kind of a big concept right now and an important one, we choose our DNA. We choose our ancestry coming into this world based on what we need to learn from this lifetime. So it may be that we have, you know, you know, six people on our maternal lineage who have had anxiety, let's say, but our anxiety is unique to our history, our past lives, why do we feel anxious? Where is that coming from? What are we scared of? What are we trying to protect? And all of that. So, so that information, even though the, the ancestry is, is fine because it gets us a certain way, it gets us a certain so far on our journey, but it's more important in my perspective to understand that we're healing generations of our soul, <laughs> generations of lifetimes with, within us. And those people, those people are responsible for their souls. Ultimately, I'm glad if I can heal myself, it helps them in some way. Awesome. Because anytime we're, we heal something within ourselves, it's going to affect whoever else is involved. Right. So whether it's in our lineage or the person we work with, you know, if we can heal something within us, then it's a blessing and a healing for them as well. So, um, so, you know, but ultimately we are. Um, we are healing our own lineage. So we learn how the past influences our present life and why we see things the way we do and why sometimes we don't understand why, why, why does this look like this to me when I, there's part of me that understands it's like this, you know, if we, or you've talked to somebody, it's like, how can you see such and such in a certain way when it's obviously this way. Well, because they're seeing that through their past life filters. They're seeing it through their karmic filter, I should say. They're seeing it through their karmic filter. And for whatever reason, in that moment, that's what they're working on. That's what they're struggling with. So, um, and as we understand that our past lives exist, it helps us to cooperate with our healing because we understand, hey, there's more to me than meets even my eye when I look in the mirror and I've got to understand and give myself some compassion and patience as I'm working on things because it's been around a lot longer than I probably realized when I started working on it. Benefits of past life knowledge. Um, it gives us right perspective and new understanding, peace of mind, you know, because we can see the bigger picture. We can see what we can do about it. Um, it helps explain some of the apparent unfairness in our lives, in our world. It assures us that life is continuous and that life is not unjust, even though in one lifetime, if we look at one lifetime from our human third dimensional perspective, then things seem extremely unfair. But if we are able to step back and look at the whole picture, it's like we, are, we all chose to be where we're at so that we can learn what we need to learn. And when I say chose to be where we're at, I want to be careful with that because I know that that's a really hard concept. So what I want to say is, um, you know, insofar as our karma allowed, we chose the best life possible for us. We came into the best life possible for us to heal as much as we're able and willing to heal in our lifetime. And um, being able to see that from that bigger picture, the, the, the silver lining of that is that, hey, we are all going to wake up eventually. We are all going to be understanding and compassionate um, human beings and then spiritual beings eventually. That's just how it's going to happen. So sometimes we have to hold our breath and be very patient, right? All right. So... Um, those past life clues are all around us all the time. And the handouts that are on my website, here's a screenshot. If you go to my website, centerfordynamichealing.com, 
and you go over to spiritual support and then you go down to handouts. There's a drop down menu that, that shows up. You go down to handouts, then we've got our um, handouts from our series this last four weeks. Uh, I've got a few others down below too, but we're going to be looking at these next two, just the parts of them because they're long and you can do them on your own and it's really they're really fun to think about and do on your own. So, but they're available there if you didn't get it through the um, email, second email that came in today. And thank you, Liz, for pointing that out for me. Um, and I'll send them out with a recording as well. So, all right. So the first one, again, I'm just going to look at a few questions so we can you know, just kind of go over what we're looking at here. So who are you and where have you been? This is an awesome, fun worksheet for looking at those past life clues. It's, you know, anytime we have an attraction or an aversion to something, that's information for us. So just noticing inside when we're going about our day, being able to feel, you know, oh, I really, really like this. I never realized how much I liked that before. That must be a clue. Or I really, really don't like that. And that must be a clue. So thinking about something like, do you gravitate toward a particular style of furniture or the furniture or um, styles of a particular time period? And what, if so, what are those? What did, you know, what do you, are you attracted to? I remember when I first did this, I was attracted to um, country, French, French country style of furniture, kind of, um, kind of farmy, flowery, and it's not really my taste now, but I, I understood later why that was um, something that I enjoyed. So what, what style of furniture do you dislike? You know, oh my gosh, I can't stand the, you know, mission style or whatever, whatever it is, you know, just kind of keep track of that and notice that again, and the more you pay attention to these clues, the more clues you will see and, and will be made, you'll get support in, in those being made aware to you. What kind of ethnic food do you like best or do you eat most often? What kind of ethnic food do you like the least? I remember um, when I was pregnant with my oldest, um, I couldn't stand Chinese food. It's, it, Chinese food is still not my favorite food. It's like way down on my list of, Lynn, what are you hungry for? But when I was pregnant with her, um, I craved Chinese food all the time. And, and my oldest was in a lifetime, a Chinese lifetime with me. Um, and so I, I got that. And, you know, it was years later that I understood that. But um, the people in the office knew I was pregnant because I was craving Chinese food and it was not anything I ever craved. Like you're craving Chinese, Chinese food, the Chinese, you know, the, the kind of food you complain about all the time, like, oh, I'm never hungry for that. So yeah, kind of revealed my, my pregnancy at that time. Um, but yeah, but those, those kind of things are, um, and the reason I have an aversion to it is because it was not, um, ah, there's culture kind of shoved down my throat in that lifetime. And so, you know, that was part of me that kind of rebelling against that. I like Chinese food just fine. I'll eat it. It's fine, but it's still not my favorite. Um, but it shows that I've worked through that, right? And I say, oh, yeah, Chinese food, fine, whatever. All right. Um, who are the three people in your life whom you feel closest to? Who are the three people in your life whom you feel an aversion to? What kind of hobbies do you have? What kind of activities do you avoid? Again, it's the, it's energy, right? It's like, what, what do you, what do you desire? And what are you pushing away from? All of that energy of attraction or aversion came from somewhere. So, you know, just food for thought, food for thought. And there's a lot more questions on that worksheet as well. And this is a fun one also. These are both from Jane Elizabeth. What are your desires for your next lifetime? So remember that desire is what makes our karmic wheel go around, our reincarnation cycle go around. So um, every desire we have, the law in the universe is that all of our desires must be fulfilled. So what desire do you have for your next lifetime? Do you want to be a man or a woman? You've got to choose. 
And why do you want to be a, a man or a woman in your next life? What kind of characteristics would you have? Eye color, hair color, you know, what, what do you want your body to look like? Um, what types of parents would you like to have? Where would you like to live? How much education do you want to have? How much money and material acquisitions would you like? So all of these are um, ways to understand how now you are shaping your next lifetime. I've always said that I want to do someday a class for, um, for our older population because um, I, want, I want them to know that everything, them, like I'm not one of them there nearly, but you know, if we know that everything we do up until our last breath in this lifetime is shaping our next life, then we might handle things differently at the end of our lives, right? We might handle things. I mean, I love that hospice exists because that's giving people this more peaceful experience of death. When if you think of how people have died in the last, you know, 500 years, not so pretty, right? So it's really a beautiful service that hospice is providing because then there's this peacefulness to it and there's not such fear around it, you know? People can come into their next lifetime not fearing death all the time. Because we've had plenty of lifetimes where it's been pretty horrific. So anyway, I don't remember why I got off on that tangent, but there we go. So other ways to find past life clues, journaling, journaling, journaling. Anytime you have a strong reaction to something, positive or negative, write it down. Just keep track of it. If it's negative, maybe it's something that you can work on a little bit. If it's positive, we don't really need to work on our positive reactions. But if we keep track of them, then it's like, oh, I really love Indian food. You know, wow, I understand why I love Indian food in this lifetime because it's awesome. But there's obviously something in me that has experienced, that had a positive experience of that in some other times so that it would be, you know, like people ask, you know, People ask, you know, what would be your last meal? For me, it would be Indian food because it's so savory and comforting. And um, I just love that. Um, it's just very comforting for me, very warming. Um, but if it's not my last meal, give me some sushi. I'm happy. So anyway, just, just kind of fun. Like watching for those, those things that you really like as well as the things that are like, oh, my gosh, I can't stand this or I can't stand that or oh my gosh you know for some reason um, I can't stand high-pitched sounds so voices you know I, I you know I, when I listen to music I tend to listen to male voices or very low female voices and anything high-pitched male or female I just I just can't listen to it it just like grates on me so you know things like that like little silly things that, that seem silly but there's more information there than meets the eye. Meditating. Meditation will reveal things. Meditation remembers where we get downloaded of, you know, whatever we need to know, whether it's for, you know, mostly for this lifetime, right? Because that's where we are. That's where we're living now. So mostly our guidance comes to us for this lifetime. But if there's another lifetime that we're trying to explore, if there's, there's a relationship we're trying to heal, then you know, then we can ask for that information. Is there anything I need to know? Even just knowing that, you know, I have such a strong reaction here. I'm sure that there's more to the story than this lifetime. Okay, great. Then, then in our meditation time, we can be supported in continuing with that, that, um, you know, any kind of information that might come forward to help us. And healing and working on our issues from this lifetime is healing our other lifetime. Because remember, we've got those dreams that go all the way down. So if we're working on taking care of something in this lifetime, then we, um, we will be healing our other lifetimes too. And I have a lot of times I have had people in the past come to me and want, uh, want you know, reincarnation reading or whatever. And I don't, I don't do that because the minute somebody asks me for that, I get absolutely nothing. It only comes through. It only comes through when someone is sincerely working on 
whatever it is they're working on now and that maybe that information will be helpful. And I don't, I don't ask for that, but just sometimes that comes through. But with, when people ask for it, oftentimes, um, and I'm thinking kind of a, of a certain person coming in and really wanting the past life information so they don't have to deal with what's in front of them to deal with. And I don't work that way. And my intuition has told me it is not going to work that way. So it's so much more important to be conscious and present with the issues that we have today and work on those and, and do whatever we need to do, do our forgiveness work, do whatever work or journaling or releasing, letting go, grieving, um, embracing, having courage where we felt fear and, you know, all of that. It's so much more important just to be present with ourselves today than to be focused on finding out the past life information and missing what's in front of us to do. So, all right. So we learn how to play the cosmic game that we're in because it is kind of a game. It's a, it, there's a, it's a system, right? And um, the system has rules to it. And when the game is done, then we're, we've begun learning a new system that has different rules that doesn't work on the law of karma. It works on a different plane altogether. Um, so, but hey, we've got to do what we got to do first. So. I like this little cartoon, it's the Nirvana quest. And she's saying to her little brother, hey, you collect karma and you know you've won when you stop getting extra lives, right? So, thank you. All right, so more on karma. We are always creating karma. Um, and there's a song called Call Me Rose by Bruce Cockburn, who's um, a folk singer that's known for his folk singing songs. And I, I put a link to that and the handouts also to the lyrics to that song because it's kind of fun. It's basically a song about Richard Nixon being reincarnated as a poor um, African American girl. So it's very rewarding, especially this week. Oh, that's all I'm going to say about that. Okay, we can arise above karma by forgiveness and detaching from our lesser human desires. I mean, we're human, we're going to have desires, but um, it's if we are attached to certain things, um, like, um, like if somebody wants to, if somebody is, a, is wealthy, but wants to be a millionaire, and they keep working on becoming a millionaire, and, you know, maybe this lifetime they won't get it, but next time they will, but if they can release that desire and be satisfied with what they have, then that frees up their souls to work on something else and take care of a different, a whole probably a whole bunch of different pieces of karma in this lifetime. So, you know, our desires can be very distracting to our healing and our, our growth. So sometimes we have to, you know, even if we don't give it up completely, we have to take a step back from it and say, okay, but, but there's something in me that is calling for more healing, more depth to my life. So, um, and whatever we don't forgive or let go, we draw into our future life or future lives, depending on how long it takes us to do that forgiveness work. So that's a really good motivation for forgiving and, and letting things go, um, unless you don't mind coming back over and over again. So also understanding that our karma colors how we see reality. So I put down here my sewing karma, which I have briefly mentioned in the past, and I remember how this colored my reality while I was growing up. So my mom, um, you know, as a kid, you go shopping with your mom, right? So I remember when we would go into a fabric store, um, even saying that I get tired, I would walk into that store and I would feel exhausted. I would barely be able to, I felt like I couldn't breathe, not that I, I didn't have an anxiety attack. I'm sure my mom didn't even know because it was all internal and I didn't really understand it until, again, until I was older and understanding more about my past lives, but I could not stand being in there. I liked it because it was interesting in color and I didn't like it. Like it. There was something in me that was just putting this pressure on me, making me feel so tired. 
Um, and then, you know, again, when I tried to sew, it was a disaster and I would usually throw a fit and give up. Um, but I can sew buttons on things. You know, if you don't look closely, it looks just fine. Um, but that was because the reason I was having that reaction, I learned later, is that I was a, a really talented seamstress in my last lifetime and spent all my time doing that. And so when I came into this lifetime, it was definitely a feeling of um, it wasn't it wasn't quite an aversion. It was that expression of that energy had been used up. <laughs> you know, I didn't have any more desire to sew anything. It didn't get me what I wanted in my last life, which was, you know, what we all want, a little peace of mind, a little happiness. And it didn't do that for me. So, so I, I just wasn't anything that I wanted part of my life. I didn't want to spend time doing that in this lifetime. Um, likewise, in that lifetime, my, my most recent one, I grew up on a farm and I had this exact, I didn't even put this together until the last couple of weeks, but I had that exact same feeling when we would go to my grandparents' farm in Iowa, loved going there, loved going there. We'd go there, you know, two or three times a year. And, but I would always have that really heavy, it wasn't bad. It was just heavy, like tired, like I was walking through molasses when we were there. And I always figured it was like, oh, we would get up early to drive two and a half hours there. And, you know, I'd be tired of the kid. My, you know, I had allergies. So my allergies would usually act up because my sleep was thrown off and blah, blah, blah. So I always thought it was bad. But then I, you know, just, I just remember, oh my gosh, that was the same feeling as the sewing store. And so just really that aversion to, not avert, I mean, it is an aversion, but it wasn't a bad aversion. It wasn't like something I had to work on. It was just trying to tell me something, you know. Um, and I remember too, my, my older sister loved animals. Oh my gosh, we had so many critters in the house growing up. And I'm like, oh my God, please just, you know, my poor dog, he's just lucky I see him every day. It's just like, animals are just like not my I like them from a distance, you know, but, you know, but it came from that lifetime too, where I had to, growing up, I had to take care of a lot of animals and I've been there, done that, checked it off my list a long time ago. So I am a city girl in this lifetime. So anyway, those kind of things colored how I was experiencing my grandparents' house. I don't remember anybody else feeling that way, but, um, and then also my creative karma, which is part of part of my sewing karma, but it goes back many, 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 many lifetimes that, you know, a thread of, um, of that ability that has come through many lifetimes. And, you know, I can't draw, I mean, you have firsthand seen my drawings. This is not, um, that is not how I it showed up in this lifetime, but being able to put things together, um, to be able to have an idea like I think of my, my last lifetime and I had, I, you know, I would have an idea of, oh, I want to create this outfit. So maybe I would find a pattern for it or maybe I would know enough to how to put that together that I could just create it. And I know people, people do that. <laughs> I don't do that. I don't know how to do that, but I know how to have an idea. Okay, so I've got this idea. I know how I want it to look. And I know how to put it together. So when I'm teaching this class, I know what I want to be able to share. Like I know it's important to share. There's like this broader idea. It's like I need to share this. So then it's, okay, how do I put that information together in a way that is logical and, and hopefully makes sense? <laughs> I'm having fun doing it. Hopefully it makes sense. Um, you know, so that I can put it out there and, and, you know, it helps somebody. So, so that has come from a lot of different lifetimes. And last week I had this, this revelation that, um, you know, and I've had some difficulties with the, the news recently and just like, why, why is it so hard for people to have, you know, to be able to discern what's true and what's not true. And I don't care what side you're on. Everybody thinks that everything is not true or their truth is truth and whatever. So, um, so anyway, I'm not going to go there, but what, um, 
but I was really getting worked up about it in the last couple of weeks. And it was just really frustrating to me. And then when I was talking, I don't know if I mentioned, I don't know what context I was mentioning it in last week um, during our time together. I said, oh, that's from when I was the newspaper person. So it was this, this man who um, put um, newspapers, flyers, political flyers together um, during the revolutionary, before the revolutionary war. And I got fed some bad information in that lifetime. Um, and so, so my reputation was, um, was crushed. My reputation, like nobody would listen to me. Nobody believed me. And, you know, energy was high. Um, people were on one side or the other, you know, very similar to how it's been in, you know, the last few months. Um, and so what I realized last week was like, oh, my energy about the newspaper today was my energy around having been fed misinformation and how um, that can rile people up and, and be really violent and, <laughs> and devastating. So anyway, so, so that's, kind of, that's kind of an example of how those strong reactions are coming from somewhere. There's a reason we think so, so strongly. And, and yes, we are always evolving towards more compassion, towards more right um, use of our humanhood. And in the midst of all that, we have our own individual things that we're working on that we need to be aware of. It's like, it's fine for me to think whatever I want to think about the news that is available, um, the news and the not news that is available out there. But my reaction is my responsibility. And my reaction was coming from somewhere else. And if I let that energy build too much, I could be destructive with it and then create more karma for myself. And I'm trying not to do that. So, um, you know, so, so that's why it's good for me to be aware of it. It's like, oh, okay, so I need to tone down that, that riled upness that I get into when um, about the subject. Because it's one thing to be able to see what's right and what's not. It's another thing to be able to, it's another thing to like um, filter large amounts of emotion through that and be offensive to somebody I don't need to be offensive to. So anyway, real life example right there. Okay, so eventually as we work through these things and we, we in, get an understanding of the system, then we can share it with others. We can help other people. And that's ultimately where we all get to. So, so, so what if I stop reincarnating? What the heck is there for me after that? You know, life is fun. There's a lot of fun things in life. Why would I want to stop? And what happens is that the more we understand about how things are working and the more our own illusions about our human existence get unraveled, then the more we want to help other people unravel their illusions if, if they want to, if that's their time to do it, because it's not time for everybody to do that. Um, you know, but then we know how to help other people. It's like, you know, it's kind of like one of the things that, that has helped me be a better therapist than I would have otherwise that I, I work on myself. So if I can understand my own emotional reactions to things and not be afraid of them, and maybe I don't like them all the time, but, but I can see them and, and sometimes I'm really stubborn about it, but eventually I'll see it and I'll go, okay, I, I want, I want to heal this in me. And as I do that for myself, then maybe nobody else on the planet has the same issues that I have but they have their own issues and those issues are in the same human machine that I have. And so it helps me know how to help other people, right? And so that is so true. The more we learn about ourselves, the more we understand everybody else on the planet because we are all machines <laughs> in this process. We are all in this system and regardless, our experiences are all different. Even if we went through the exact same lifetime together side by side, our experience of that lifetime is going to be world different. So it's not about the experiences. It's about, okay, here's my emotional reaction that's unhealed. I need to heal it. Here's my unforgiveness. I need to forgive it. Here's something I'm attached to that's getting in my way of, 
of feeling free because it's, 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 it's making me look at the shiny thing over here when I really need to be looking inside of myself. So I need to let this go so that I can be whole with myself. I can be more aligned with my, my potential, with my whole real self, you know, and, and we, we learn how to do that for ourselves and then we're able to see that better for other people. So how do we get off the law of karma? There, we are, our job is to get off the law of karma eventually and, and thus off the need for um, reincarnation. So a few things that are helpful is that, you know, remember that you've been here before and what's happening in the present is a result of past actions. So that is, that is always true, always true. There's nothing in our human world that is outside the law of karma. So everything has already been put into motion by something that has happened in the past. So the more we can just handle our emotional reactions around it and be patient with everything else that is involved, it's, you know, I'm, I can forgive whatever I need to forgive, but then I just have to wait until the situation passes, that karmic piece passes, but I'm not adding new energy to it. So that helps that karmic piece dissolve. Our desire to wake up is very important. It's remember desire is what makes the world go round. So that desire um, is the fuel for our awakening and being a good observer of ourselves, being self-aware, they call it metacognition, right? The ability to, to think about your thinking um, is really important because our thoughts, the, the thoughts that go through our mind randomly are mostly from our subconscious. So if we pay attention to them, oh yeah, that was a weird thought that I had. Hmm, I don't really feel that way. Then that's information for us that we can use. Meditation, meditation, meditation is the way we learn how to differentiate between those clues that are coming up from our thoughts and um, our intuition and you know, our problem solving thinker thoughts also and forgiveness. Forgiveness, forgiveness, forgiveness gets us off the law of karma. All right. So, yes, forgiveness erases karma. Um, that's a phrase of Jane Elizabeth that I put this little thing together. This is when I had a lot of time on my hands before I had a therapy practice. I did stuff like this. Yeah. So let's see. Okay. So how to play the karmic game and win. Oh, this is fun. So Jane Elizabeth created um, a game called... Um, well, it's called the game of life, okay? And the game board is your life. Your life is the game board. So you can look at your life, like, okay, here's my game board, and I am a piece on this game board. The object of the game is to pay off karma without creating more. The players are you and everyone in your life, all the situations that happen. What stops the game is fear, resentment, and revenge. And how do we get back in the game? Forgiveness and releasing. And the winner gets free from the karmic wheel and advances in consciousness. So she also created your karmic scorecard. And this is on my handouts page as well. I didn't send this one out in the email because um, I didn't think it would make sense without the context of our evening. I've got one printed out here. And so this is, to keep track of your karmic points, your karmic credits, your spiritual credits, Jane Elizabeth calls them sometimes. So if you forgive, you get 100 points. And these numbers are obviously arbitrary and made for fun. So if it's a really hard forgiveness, give yourself a thousand points because you deserve it. Um, meditation, you get 60 points. If you meditate twice a day, give yourself 120 points. If you meditate a little extra longer, give yourself 75 points. Um, taking action, so if you receive guidance and um, you act on it, give yourself, how many points is that? 75 points. Going beyond fear is very hard sometimes. It says 55 points. I would never only give myself 55 points for going beyond fear. I think that's, I think that's at least 95. So we can, we can change that one. 
um, giving unconditional love, doing something for other people without thought for yourself, um, loving the people who are hard to love. This said 45 points, depends on the person, right? So your discretion. Um, not responding to anger, 30 points. I know for some days for me, I deserve a lot more than 30 points for not responding to my anger. Um, staying in clear think. Remember our spiritual, spiritual thermometer, you know, our clear think is above a five, it's even at like a seven um, on that spiritual thermometer and being able to maintain that, you know, and that observer self, that listening inside helps us to maintain that stay in clear thing. Staying out of ego also means staying above a five. It means staying, not responding to anger, not responding to emotion one way or the other of like, oh my gosh, I love this. I need this now when I'm supposed to be um, doing my meditation time. You know, that pulling myself out of that and, and sitting and doing my journaling when I would rather be doing anything else in the world. That's staying out of my ego and supporting my soul. So I get some points for that. We can get points for that. Listening to your intuition, listening to your heart. Sometimes they're different things. Intuition um, is, you know, it can be show up as guidance. Uh, listening to your heart could be, um, you know, a, a deeper kind of um, intuitive sense. It could be just, being in meditation and being open, having, feeling that heart sense and sharing that light in with whoever is with you in the room, even if you don't say anything, that energy goes out and, and touches them. Um, being open to new opportunities is 50 points. And that's what we wanna do for 2021, right? When we release the year 2020, we are letting go of all the emotions that we have uh, carried with us throughout this year. And I think we might have an emotion or two about 2020 and we want to let that go so that we can be open to 2021 and say, you know, Hey, bring, bring it on. We are, we are open to our, to a better year. We're open to whatever possibilities we have individually and praying for guidance when in doubt, practicing that guidance is so important. Give yourself points for that. And, you know, 35 points each time. So you have, there's always lots of good opportunities to do that. So it's just a fun way that um, Jane Elizabeth created, gotta move my light here, um, created to, to be aware of the things that we have to do on our journey in order to be aware that there's more going on, how to support ourselves, how to support our healing and our awakening. And it's all, it's all good. It's all progress in there. And um, the Spiritual Power Tools book, I actually have mine next to me today, um, backs you up on all of this. And I was thinking as I was working on the PowerPoint tonight that, you know, if you go back and look at that Spiritual Power Tools book, or if you go back and look at our videos from our Spiritual Power Tools study, um, you'll see that, <laughs> my poor dog is going crazy here. Um, you'll see that these tools fit into exactly what we're talking about. These tools are there to help us wake up and to help us forgive, release, let go and keep moving forward and keep expanding our intuition. And so, so going back and revisiting that may, you may have a different perspective on it now after our, our soul evolution series here. All right. And we have um, another fun little picture of reincarnation and, and, um, let's just take some meditation time now. I'm going to actually take this off because that's not necessarily, we're trying to move beyond that. So that's not necessarily the image we want to meditate on. So, but let's do have some meditation time. I invite you to get comfortable. I don't know how long my dog's going to allow me to, um, to uh, meditate quietly here because he is either hungry or has to go to the bathroom. So, but we'll, we'll do our best. Just relax in your chair and take a few deep breaths. Again, a lot of information that you can take with you. And think about later. 
Maybe you have some excitement about looking for those clues. I'm just gonna put all of that on the side right now. Get in touch with that. Let's say that devotion in your heart. What, what does that feel like to you? That that desire for your spiritual awakening. When you think of that, where does that land in your body? Is it in your heart? Is that spiritual longing? Is it in your mind, that mind that knows there's something more and works very hard to try to figure it out, even if the mind can never figure it out? Definitely, but sometimes that's where our desire can show up. Sometimes it feels like a desire to go home or a desire to be with our beloved. But that's the desire that propels our work to wake up. It motivates us to do whatever we need to do to heal something. It doesn't have to be our entire iceberg, just to heal something, to forgive someone so that we're free, not carrying that with us for another year, let alone another lifetime. Feel that longing. And feel yourself turning that longing over to your higher power, whatever that looks like to you, to the universe, to the light in front of you, to the image of a spiritual teacher, perhaps. You're giving that desire. And that says, I want this and I need help. I need help waking up, as we all do. We can't, we don't know what we don't know. We can't see what we don't see. Just turn that over and then let your experience of the peace after turning that over, the trust that you'll be supported in every possible way. And whatever it is that you're working on right now, whether it's waking up to your whole self or healing something or experiencing more peace, experiencing more joy, expressing more of who you are, whatever that is. This is a time where that desire is supported.
the more we pay attention to what's happening on the inside, what's coming out from our subconscious, from our intuition, from our thoughts, the more we understand what to do on the outside. The human mind understands things from the outside to the inside. The spiritual mind understands things from the inside out. That's why meditation is important. There's so much to know about ourselves. And there's so much beautiful support when we explore that internal life. So much support for being guided through, for being made aware of information that will help us. Your desires are supported. Our desires are supported. Always, always, always. Our job is to support ourselves, to help clear the path. Our our intuition shows us what needs to be cleared, and our job is to do the work to clear it. So in your own way, say some words of gratitude for your spiritual support. Maybe you feel it, maybe you don't, but it's there. 
all around you. Thank you for helping me see what I need to see. Thank you for opening my eyes, the ears of my heart. Helping me quiet my mind just enough to see what's there, see what I need to see, and to be open to new ideas from that infinite wisdom that's available to each of us. Thank you for, for fulfilling my heart's desire. Thank you for fulfilling my heart's desire. Now returning to that place where you first felt your spiritual desire, your head, your heart, your gut, your feet, wherever. Take a deep breath, knowing that that desire will be fulfilled always, always, always. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Take a deep breath. Two or three. When you're ready, open your eyes. And thank you for joining me on this adventure. Looking at our soul evolution through all the forms of consciousness and reincarnation and karma and our human journey. And how important it has been to us, no matter no matter what we've done in the past, all the good things and all the not so hot things that we've learned from, and we've grown into who we are today because of all those experiences. And we continue, we continue now, moving forward to to wake up. And every desire we have that we're working toward is helping us wake up. Every difficult person in our world is there to help us wake up. Every tough situation that we have to move through is there to wake us up. And Spiritual Power Tools has lots of wonderful support in there. And we have each other certainly to back each other up through those difficult times. So thank you for coming tonight. And I will be in touch very soon. Have a wonderful evening. Good night.